Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode on my book chat. I've got another fantastic guest for you guys to meet today. We're going to be discussing his books, his writing, and everything else. So let me bring him in. How you doing, Larry? I'm doing fine, Maddie. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Yes, I'm excited to hear more about your work. So go ahead and tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about you and your work. Well, basically, I guess in the business, I'm considered an old news dog. <laughs> I came up through journalism. I, very young age, started with a weekly newspaper, went to a, a daily uh, publishing operation. From there, got into radio, into television. Through it all, it was it, journalism. It was either writing or on the air or reporting or whatever. I did it all and uh, did that for several years before I went freelance, uh, did work for the uh, U uh, UPI, the wire service, and uh, have continued to do a lot of freelance in addition to my book writing. Nice. So what got you into book writing then? Does it, did it just kind of come naturally when you got to sit down and work on it? Well, I, I guess it's, you know, I write nonfiction. So it kind of ties into what, what I've always done all my life is, you know, find a story, get the facts and tell other people about it. And I enjoy that. I enjoy the research. I enjoy finding uh, stories that have not been told before or have been sort of looked over, you know, lightly. So it's, it's part of what I've always done. It just I'm taking it to a different level now in writing books. The first book I wrote many years ago was actually uh, a book that was about a, a little community that had become almost a ghost town. And I had known the community when it was thriving uh, because at that time I was in uh, radio news and our uh, community press club used to meet out in that area. And uh, I was very disappointed when I went back to see how the town had just basically become almost nothing. And I thought, I need to record the history of this town. And that's how it all started. That was, to some degree, a success. I got a lot of good response. And it sort of motiv motivated me to, to go forward with this idea. And, and that's uh, what has taken me to writing more books. That is really cool. And I, I like how you dug in to find that research. That kind of makes me want to do that about my hometown because it's a really small hometown, but it used to be big when the railroad, railroad was really busy and everything. So that's actually really cool that you did that because you got to find all those old stories, those fascinating stories. Well, so it, cool. yeah, it's interesting to find um, pieces of, of history that you think this is, if, if this isn't recorded, it'll be lost. Yeah. And, and that was the fun part of it, to keeping, keeping these stories alive. Uh, it was much similar. One of my freelance stories that I did um, several years ago, uh, you remember when the uh, film uh, 12 Years a Slave won the Academy Awards? Mm -hmm. well, it so happened that I, the area I live in, uh, those 12 years, for uh, Solomon Northrop actually took place in that area. And I had been researching that just out of curiosity, going to all the places and, and taking photos and talking to people. So I had a pretty intense library build up of, of the story of the 12 years. Well, so what happens, the movie wins the Academy Awards and I've got the whole thing already covered, uh, you know, just out of curiosity, and uh, went to the uh, local daily newspaper, which was part of a newspaper chain, mm -hmm. and I said, I've got your Sunday feature for you if you want it. Well, they jumped on it, it went throughout the chain, and again, it, I guess the reason I'm sharing this is it's, uh, just when you see something that interests you, and that interested me, mm -hmm. you never know what it's gonna interest somebody else. And to have all that information written and the photos uh, done, uh, what a find that was at that particular time. Yeah, that is interesting. And also something that really caught my eye was your book, Shipwrecked and Rescued. 
what brought you to that story? To which story? I'm sorry, man. The shipwrecked and rescue. Or, okay. Well, when I was in television, I was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And we, I used to go up into Upper Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, and cover stories up there. So I, 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 I really fell in love with the area because there's so much history. Uh, the, the old days of copper mining and, and the iron mines and so forth. So I try to go back up to there just to visit as often as I can. Well, about two years ago, I was sort of on one of my summer visits to uh, northern upper Michigan, the, the Keweenaw Peninsula. And I had heard just a little piece of information about this shipwreck. And I started looking into it and I thought, this is an amazing story. No one has really ever put it all together. A shipwreck on Lake Superior where not only did they rescue the people, but there were over 200 brand new Chryslers on that ship. And ultimately, the Chryslers got rescued too. And how each of that was accomplished, both rescuing the crew because they almost froze to death. Yeah. Uh, and then later being able to go back in and get the cars off of that boat. The boat didn't sink. What happened is a storm threw it onto a reef off of the Keweenaw Peninsula. So the boat didn't sink other than it was badly damaged. It was gashed. The bottom lower level was filling with water. And the boat was a, a total loss. Mm -hmm. But here it is. It's high on a reef in, the, in Lake Superior. And the first thing is, what about the crew? Well, the crew got rescued because they were able to take a lifeboat, chop it loose from the ice that accumulated, and they were able to get to shore. But then they were totally lost. They're up there. The snow is, you know, four or five feet deep. They're lost. They're not dressed for what's happened to them. And this was 1925. There were no communications. No one knew what happened to them. Uh, no one knew that they'd wrecked. So they wandered around for two days, and only because of a lucky break of a Coast Guard rescue boat that was going to rescue some other people happened to stumble upon them and how they were rescued and later saved. And it, it's all in the book, the family that's basically saved them, fed them, and took care of them before they were able to get into the hospital. So this is like in the end of November, mm -hmm. 1925. Meanwhile, we have an abandoned, destroyed ship sitting on a reef with 240 brand new Chryslers. Well, Mr. Chrysler said, I want my cars back if possible. And they hired a, he hired a salvage company out of Duluth, Minnesota, to, to take on this mission. And what basically they did, they waited, waited until January when the ice had frozen around the reef. And they were able to get the cars off of the boat. We've got some fantastic pictures in there of this all being done. They got them off of the boat and onto the reef and then they were able, because the ice had frozen solid enough, to drive them to the shore and then along the shoreline to a very small community up there called Copper Harbor. Holy so cow. You've got, now, this is January of 1926. Copper Harbor, probably population 36, with 240 brand new Chryslers sitting in there, right? And they are now still pretty much abandoned because the snow, the one road that went to Copper Harbor and Copper Harbor is as far north as you could go in Michigan. You're right on the tip in Lake Superior. But the one road is not plowed in the winter time and the snow up there can get, they can get a winter accumulation of over 300 inches of snow, which they did this past winter. So the next mission is where do we go with the cars? Well, the plan was if you could get them to a town that's about 40 miles away, there's a railroad 
people there, get them to that town, and get them on a train and ship them back to Detroit. Well, sounds easy, but when you've got, you know, snow five, six feet deep and a road that is not open, it was not easy. And, yeah. it, and again, in the book, we explain how they got them out of there, how they got gas into them, you know, how they got them back to this train depot. And in the meantime, what about the guys? Where are they? Well, they're in a hospital. Little by little, they're recovering. They're coming back, going back to their homes, you know. And one of the interesting stories about not only rescuing the, the crew and all these cars, but there was one, at least one car, and we think more because we were able to track more, that didn't go back to Detroit. Mm -hmm. And the one particular car um, was owned by a family for over 69 years, wow. it down from one to another. And that car today, you can see it. It's at a lighthouse museum in Eagle Harbor, Michigan, Upper wow. Peninsula, Michigan. That car has got over 200,000 miles on it. And it's an amazing thing. You go there, they'll show you a place on the car where there's an ax mark where they cut the ice off of the car to get it off of the off of the boat. So wow. The story is just, it goes in so many directions to bring it all together. And that's, no one had done that. No one had taken all these pieces. They had just said, well, you know, there was a boat that wrecked and they got the cars off of it. <laughs> that sounds easy, but it sure was not easy. Yeah, and that's really cool that you dug up all those pieces to put together because it does make for a fascinating tale. Well, and the photos, Maddie, the photos are unbelievable. One of the things that help us in getting the photos is the captain of the Coast Guard rescue boat was an amateur photographer. Oh my God. So he took a lot of pictures, and then after the crew was rescued, he stayed with the story. He'd go out and take pictures when they were getting cars off the boat. And it just, there's some absolutely amazing photos that are part of the book. We, we also uh, had a lot of help from historical associations, uh, relatives, mm -hmm. you know, people who had either a grandfather or a a father that was involved in some way that, that came forward and we were able to interview them and, and to get more pictures. And it, it's just, it, it's one of those stories like we talked about. I am so glad that I was able to find it and put it all together so that it'll be there for other people to enjoy. Yes. Cause that's, that's going to be a good story for that family and anybody related to any of those people to go back and be like, Hey, I had a family member in this and that's where we're related to these guys. Those are really cool things because I've always loved going back and pinpointing like who it was related to from the past for crazy stories like that. And that's that is awesome because that is a piece of history that you've preserved in your story in your book. Yeah, it was, and and I've been very satisfied after because people have come up to me. I've I've done a lot of book signings. I've I've gone to a lot of events, and people have come up to me and said. We are so glad this book was put together because it needed to be done. Somebody needed to capture it. You know, uh, uh, it makes you feel good. You know what they say, artists paint, you know, painters paint and writers write, and we hope that somebody will pay attention. Well, <laughs> somebody is definitely paying attention to this book, and, and we really appreciate that. Yes, yes. And I have to ask too, because your other one, you talk about the Coca-Cola trail on here. The, did you put as much work into that as you did as the shipwreck one? Yeah, well, this the, the shipwreck book was done in a year. Mm -hmm. I, I discovered the story last summer and we had it out in June of this year. Nice. Uh, the Coca-Cola book, which is called the, the Coca-Cola trail. It took me two and a half years because I went to many of the places that are in the book. First of all, the book is not about Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, It's about all the places in the United States that have Coca-Cola memories. Where was Coca-Cola bottled? You could, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a travel book with history. You can go to, what I did in picking the places, 
I picked places where you can go and see something that was Coca-Cola. Maybe it's an old bottling plant that is now a museum or an entertainment center. And while you're there, we're going to tell you what it was. what's the history to this place. You know, the thing that was the most exciting, I found out in the when I did the first chapter, Coca-Cola was not first bottled in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. It was first bottled in Vicksburg, Mississippi. A, a, a little uh, gentleman there that had a, a soda fountain and a candy store. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and he was doing like everybody else. They'd take the syrup and they'd put it in a glass and give it a charge of carbonated water and he had a Coca-Cola. You know, and he, a, a situation evolved where he thought, boy, if I could bottle this, you know, I mean, this is, we're talking 1895. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the, for the people to come to town and get a Coca-Cola, that was a real project. He thought, if I can bottle this, I can get the Coca-Cola to the people in the country. And he, he bought a second-hand bottling machine up in St. Louis, took it back to Vicksburg, Mississippi, you know, when it was a hand-on operation, you know, and started bottling Coca-Cola. He did it for almost five years before anybody else did it. You know, and we, so we tell that story. And if you go to Vicksburg, you can go to the place. They've restored the old soda fountain candy store. They've restored the area where the bottling took place and the old machines are in there. And you can see it. You can go in and see it and, and just like it was when, when he was bottling Coke. You know, the, the interesting thing through the whole book is there's all these families that got involved. But the, the real interesting thing is that Coca-Cola at first didn't think bottling Coca-Cola was a good idea. And it was finally when two gentlemen from Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. went to Atlanta and talked to Mr. Candler, who owned Coca-Cola and was making syrup, talked to him and said, we want the rights, the exclusive rights to bottle Coca-Cola. And exclusive meaning the whole United States. And he told him, he said, that is really a dumb idea. He said, he said, I don't know, I, I don't approve of that at all. Well, they kept they were attorneys, by the way. And they kept working on him. And finally he said, Okay, all right, you guys draw up a contract, bring it to me in the morning, I'll look at it. So they go back to their hotel and they draw up a contract for exclusive rights, the only people to bottle Coca-Cola in the United States. They take it back to Mr. Candler. He looks at it. He says, well, I can, I can do this, but I can't do it for Mississippi because they're already bottling it there. But he sold the rights to bottle Coca-Cola throughout the United States for $1. And it's, it was said that he never bothered to collect the dollar. He just wanted to get those guys out of there. You know, he oh told gosh. them when they left to go back to Chattanooga, he said, this is a dumb idea. If it doesn't work, don't you come whining back to me about it. <laughs> so, so here they are. We've got two young businessmen. They now have the rights to bottle Coca-Cola all over the United States. They go back to Chattanooga. And uh, they, well, let's we'll open a bottling plant. So they opened a little bitty bottling plant. They've only got fifteen hundred dollars, and they thought, no, this is not the answer. And then all of a sudden, they think, wait a minute, we've got the rights. Let's sell territories. You know, today we call that franchise, right? Yeah. So if you wanted to bottle Coca Cola in Paducah, Kentucky, they would sell you a territory, 50 mile territory, and you were the Coca-Cola bonder. Now, you would buy that territory, and this was, you know, 1905, 1904, whatever. You'd buy it for $1,500. Mm -hmm. But you also had to use Coca-Cola syrup, obviously. Yeah. It, it would taste like Coca-Cola. So you would order your syrup to bottle your Coca-Cola from Atlanta, Georgia. 
But every time you ordered syrup, the guys that sold you the territory, they got a commission on that. So they continued to make money while you made Coca-Cola, you know. And that really, Maddie, is how Coca-Cola took off so fast across the United States. You had all these people that invested a few dollars to make a product, and it just took off because it, it was just, they were protecting their investment, promoting your product, promoting Coca-Cola. So. That's that's what the story is about. That's what the book's about. We follow all these people who had the dream, who bought the territory, who built little plants and then bigger plants and so on. And you can go today and see a lot of those places and you can find out what they were, what they are now. And again, just like the shipwreck book, a lot of old photos. I mean, we went to historical societies, we went to families, we were able to get all the Coca-Cola photos to include in each chapter. And there's some, you know, we talk about Vicksburg, there's a, a picture in Vicksburg where it was first modeled. It shows a gentleman on a horse-drawn wagon loaded with wooden cases full of Coca-Cola. Well, what what did we call him? We had to call him the world's first Coca Cola delivery man. Yeah, he was, you know. And his picture is in the book. You know, it's it's just uh, that was a fun book to do, but yeah. it took a lot of time and a lot of research. There's there's thirty chapters in the book. Each is, you can take it a chapter at a time. And I've I've had people send me an email and say next summer. On my vacation, I'm going to go to so many places that you've written about in the book, because it is, it's, it's kind of a guide, a travel guide, especially if you're a Coca-Cola collector. Nice. That, that's pretty awesome. I think I might have to get it and do the same thing. So my, my family has always loved Coca-Cola and my cousin's grandpa, he worked in, I want to say the bottling company that was in my, used to be in my hometown in Idabel, Oklahoma. So, yeah, he collected a lot of Coca-Cola paraphernalia. And, yeah, his wife has it now because he passed yeah, away. Coca-Cola collectors are everywhere. And they have, for those that are really involved, they have a, a, a national organization. And, uh, and there's state groups. There are even uh, Coca-Cola collector groups like in Japan and Australia and England, places like that. Once a year, they have an annual convention, and all these Coca-Cola collectors get together. They bring their treasures, you know, and some of them for sale. Some of them they want to buy somebody else's, and it's an amazing thing to see all these old Coca-Cola memorabilia pieces either for sale or being displayed. Um, there's, again, we say in the book, and it's true, there is no other brand anywhere that is collected like Coca-Cola. It just has such a fascination to it. Yeah. And it's memories, you know, it's memories. One of the things we write about in the book are how communities will spend thousands of dollars to restore a Coca-Cola mural on the side of a building. Yeah. Now that mural was originally put up as an advertising sign, you know, buy Coca-Cola. But it, their, their, their murals were so fantastic that it became a part of the town. And I asked somebody one time, there was a, a little town in Michigan that between the town raising money and the state of Michigan donating to the cause, they spent $50,000 to restore a mural on the side of a building on the Kalamazoo River. And I asked them, I said, that's a lot of money just to restore a piece of advertising. They said, oh no, this is not advertising. This is a memory of our community. This is part of our community, you know, and that's the way that people treat it. You know, I remember, you know, going to the Coca-Cola plant and I remember the, when I was a youngster, the, the sign of what it meant to me. And again, there's no other advertising in the world 
that has gotten the attention and the restoration, the preservation that Coca-Cola has. That's true. You know, uh, Asa Candler, you know, he was very ambitious about outdoor advertising. Hey, we're saying. I was just going to tell you a, a quick one about Mr. Candler. You know, he, Coca-Cola was probably a pioneer in outdoor advertising. And back in the, the 20s, he was out in Hollywood doing some promotional work, and they were making a movie. And he told the movie producers, the day is coming when if you make a movie outside, you will have a Coca-Cola sign in the background wherever you are. Yes. <laughs> he did that. So. But it's, a, it's typical the way Coca-Cola has continued to promote. They get involved, and they're just a one-of-a-kind company. I sound like I work for them. I don't, but I've become just fascinated by them because of what they've done. Yeah, and they really are everywhere. Because I, growing up, their logo and stuff was on everything. So it's actually really cool that you did all this research and put this together. I'm fascinated by it. What did you find was the hardest thing for you as a writer when compiling these books together? I think it's to make sure that you that you're getting all the facts because you know these are some of these pieces of history go back a long time mm -hmm. and memories and recorded memories sometimes aren't always totally factual you know what they say sometimes you can make pink bright red you know so a lot of research double checking facts is required um that's one of the things but i think also sometimes just finding the right person to talk to or the right source where the, the history is that you can get to. People sometimes make the mistake of destroying, losing, saying this is not important when for future generations it is important. You know, Coca-Cola families, I've found families that go back four or five generations of being involved in bottling, selling, distributing Coca-Cola. Um, I think the gentleman that wrote the, the foreword to my book, he's a Coca-Cola bottler, and he said, you know, when you get the franchise to bottle a Coca-Cola, he said, it's almost like getting the keys to a gold mine. Yeah, <laughs> it was a great product. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, Maddie, but I could, if you want another story, I can tell you how the Coca-Cola bottle was created. Well, I actually am kind of curious too about, because we, you had mentioned in your sign up thing a little bit about self-care and I wanted to see where you were at on how your self-care was during the process of creating all of these books and doing the research and traveling and everything. How did you take care of yourself to keep from being overwhelmed and exhausted all the time? I'm not quite sure I understood where you were going with that. How did I keep from what now? Um, when you were traveling and researching and everything, how did you take care of yourself and your mental health <laughs> to keep from being kind of like? Oh, it's it's easy to get fired up. You know, you know, you you get excited. It's like you're on the trail of a, of another. So there was never a mental problem other than you know the mental problem I already have, which is I get addicted to a story. But I think in traveling, it wasn't like I was on the road constantly. I'd pick an area and maybe I would, like when I did Arkansas, I was able to go to three different good stories in Arkansas from one end to the other. And so I'd do that. I'd plan a trip where I could get a two or three different uh, stories, I'd go up and get the facts, as they say, you know, and then and work with a recorder, a nice little portable recorder, take a lot of pictures, and then you go back home and settle in for a while, you know, to, and, and start putting together. I was, when you do this kind of a story, okay. you can take it a chapter at a time, and that's what I do. I go do a chapter, do two chapters, you know, yeah. and um Luckily, I have a, a great lady that, that does my editing and puts it all together once I get the facts together. And I'll finish a chapter and 
send it to her and she'll put it down and and create the chapter both with the pictures and with the copy. So it, uh, you need that. You know, yeah. if someone, someone's thinking about doing a book, especially a nonfiction book, you really need someone to organize your thoughts and to, to put it all together for you. Yeah, that that's hard. So the story you were wanting to share was about the creating the bottle, is that what you said? The, the unique bottle shape? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting story. Um, you know, when Coca-Cola finally started allowing people to bottle and it got very popular, there were a lot of knockoffs. You know, there was Coca-Cola is spelled with a K and just all kinds of, they'd use the word cola, you know. So people, and they would bottle, well, bottles were whatever you could get your hands on to bottle. So you go into a store and there'd be a bottle of some kind of a cola. Mm -hmm. You probably thought, oh, it must be Coca-Cola. Well, it wasn't. And, and finally Coca-Cola said, wait a minute. We need a bottle that when people walk in to a store, they know that is Coca-Cola and nobody else has got that bottle. So what they did, this was 1905. Mm -hmm. They went to the glass makers in the country and they said, Here's the challenge. Produce a bottle that will be our bottle only, and you will have the rights, exclusive rights, to make the bottle. Well, there were five companies that, in fact, took on the challenge. And after almost a year, they each company brought their bottles to a, a, a meeting of, of the bottlers to be judged. Oh. And the, the one bottle that was selected was from Terre Haute, Indiana, the Root Glass Company in Terre Haute. Mm -hmm. That bottle was selected. The others were not. And Coca-Cola said, this will be the bottle we will use. And it's that, you know, that one with the nice shape. You pick it up, you know, that's a Coca-Cola yeah. bottle. It was patented. Nobody else could use it. And at that meeting, that meeting was in 1905. Coca-Cola said all the other bottles should be destroyed. All the other ones that were here, you know, that didn't win. And to the company that won, because each company brought five bottles. Yeah. And said, we want one bottle that we're going to put in the archives, which they did. Mm -hmm. And the other bottles also should be destroyed. Well, what happened on the winning bottles, one of them escaped. Okay? And it happened that it, it ended up in the family of one of the original designers of the bottle. And that bottle stayed in that family for generations until about two or three years ago when it showed up at an estate sale in California. And that bottle sold at auction for $150,000. Woo! That's and, a lot of money and the for reason, that. The reason we know that it was that bottle, because on the bottom of it, it was dated 1905. Coca-Cola never started using that bottle until 1906. Yeah. So it was the one bottle that escaped, you know, and they told the story, this is an escaped bottle, and they could prove it because they had the date on it. Wow. You know. That's insane. I always wondered why they had their own unique shape though. Cause that that's something growing up, I was always like, why? Like, cause I always wondered why they were like the curve super curvy shape and like a glass Dr. Pepper bottle would be like straight. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a really cool. Well, I mean, like you say, everybody was bottling, you know, whatever bottle they could get their hands on to put their, their cola in it. Yeah. And it was really you went to a grocery store. You know, oh, well, there it says cola. It must be Coca-Cola. Well, maybe it wasn't, you know. Yeah, that's insane. Oh, my gosh. Well, Mr. Larry, go ahead and tell our viewers and listeners where they can find your wonderful books at. Well, each each of the books, these are my two most recent. The uh, Shipwreck book has a website, which is simply called Shipwrecked and Rescued. 
www.thepeopleshow.com. And it's, you could go there. And also I cross on the two websites, the, the other books are listed too. But if you just want to look at the Coca-Cola book, the uh, website for that is equally as simple. It's simply the Coca-Cola Trail Dot com. Now, there are two books. The first one was so well received that I did a second one, a sequel, and it's called Return to the Coca-Cola Trail. And it's got more, more stories and more pictures and so forth, you know. So um, they're both there. Uh, we, we do a special pricing uh, if people buy two whether they buy two Coca-Cola books or whether they buy a Coca-Cola book and a shipwreck book, uh, there's a special consideration there too. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Matt. I've enjoyed it. And obviously, you can tell I like to talk about both products. And that's a good thing. That is a very good thing. <laughs>